namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa Series five six. <clears throat> Today is a uh, series A Dhamma talk number six. Okay. In this series, most of our talks will be oriented and based on the insights series of insight level more on a practical basis. That's why I think it is uh, important for us to know what are the 13 stages of insight before you reach the stage of Ariya or noble person. So that we can have at least some guide some idea when we are talking during the series when we mention this insight or that insight we already have idea so we are going to deal the 13 stages of insight today but simply it's just a, a guide we are not going to go into details or in depth because details and in depth will be become evident as we talk in the series. But one should understand what are these insights and what are they called and how many stages. So it is fairly different from tradition. Traditionally, these are talk about only at the end, at the highest stage. But and here, I think we are going to start at the beginning. But just simply, basically, names, definition, general idea. So when one is practicing the Satipatthana Vipassana, our goal is to eliminate all form of suffering. Before we reach to this stage, the first major level is you have to become a Ariya. Okay. We are all in a Puduchana lineage. And then after you have accomplished or attained these 13 levels of insight, one becomes Ariya or noble person. So what are these 13 levels of insight? We are right now practicing Satipatthana Vipassana. In other words, we are exploring to understand the true nature of self. In other words, to understand the true nature of mind and matter. So these 13 stages are it is the step-by-step -step progression or revealing the true nature of this mind and matter. They go step-by-step. -step. You cannot jump around. That is a general statement. And in here too, one need to understand as soon as we mentioned about 13 levels or 13 stages of insight. Oh, I experienced this, I experienced that. Once you understand what these characteristic entities for each insight, one's mind is inclined to correlate your experience with these 
levels of insight. That's where the dangers could go in if you don't thoroughly understand what does it mean by you have reached this level of insight or that level of insight. Because one experience, let's say level one, level two, level three. Let's say level three. Assuming one yogi has experienced level three. And when one person has experienced level three, during that time, whenever you are practicing, you will come to encounter an experience like level four, experience like level five, or even experience like level 11. These kind of experience will come to in your meditation sessions. And suddenly, oh, I'm in level four, I'm in level five, I'm in level 12. That kind of understanding could arise. That is where we have to be very careful. Because you may experience okay, a certain experience that is similar to what has been described okay, in the literature, in theory. Oh, this is exactly what it is. Here it is. But that doesn't mean that you are in a level 4 or level 5 or level 12. You simply, sometimes you are ex practicing and at a certain okay, moment, okay, a certain conditions are met and you begin to experience similar to that a certain level, higher level of insight or jnana. Insights in Pali is called jnana. But one thing is, let's assume that you have experienced level four and you think you are in a level four. Fine. The way to check this next time you practice, do you have that level four experience again? Or it might be another two, three, four, five months before you experience that level four again? That's a question you need to ask yourself. Sometimes people experience very vividly, clearly level four experience. And then you don't for about six months already. And if that's the case, you are not at that level. Even though you had experiences, you are not at that level. If you are totally grounded, if you are at the level four, whenever you sit down and meditate, you can reach that state. Whenever you sit down and meditate, you can experience all the characteristics of early level four. And if you even missed for a few weeks, you sit back down and meditate, you can experience it. If you even mix quite a few months, you come back and meditate. Within a day or two, you are back there. In other words, you can get yourself into that a certain states or characteristics of the jnana or insight, almost at will. And then you can really say, I am at this, okay, if you are at will, I am at this insight on a mature level. And even on each insight, that is the uh, beginners or the the beginning level beginning level or the middle level or the mature level even in one level level four 
there are different stages. Whether you are just getting into it, or whether you are in the middle, or whether you come to the near the end of mature state. The end is, we always call it mature. That is one thing we need to keep in mind. So, even though we might talk about these 13 stages of level, and even though you might be experiencing somewhat similar to it in characteristic, don't think that you are at that insight level. You simply experience something that is similar to that characteristics. But if you can enter those characteristics at every sitting, only then you have achieved that level. That has to be keep in mind very firmly. Otherwise, you one begin to think you are really flying high and you are about to become a Ria tomorrow. Okay. A lot of yogis, especially overconfident yogi, they think they are and they are there. That kind of things could happen. So that is the first thing one needs to know about insight and this level. And do not even bother to okay, think or analyze where am I? Okay, what states am I? Of course we are curious, but if you could don't even bother to think, because you simply know whenever you sit down and meditate, if you can get into that characteristics of a certain level, you know it is there. So don't try to correlate based on the characteristics. Try to correlate based on how consistently you can get into that stage in every sitting. Okay. That has to be kept in mind very firmly and strongly. Otherwise you think the area ship is just around the corner. So starting with that, okay, we can talk about it. And also don't try to always correlate your experience with these jnana. Now we know it might be similar to what you think you are at, but it is not truly that. Leave that to your meditation instructor. They will let you know. Even though you might be reporting, okay, reporting, I see this, I see that, it experiences, experience that, and the teacher may not say anything back, because they have to listen to what you say. And when the teacher didn't say back anything, or sometime, okay, the teacher look at the yogi and then might need a little bit of a encouragement on a, a little bit of explanation. Okay, that kind of characteristics are some of the characteristics of this level or that level. The teacher might say that. But that doesn't mean that he is saying you are at that level. Keep that in mind too. Based on the yogi's requirement, the teacher may say something may suggest something or keep silence. Do not take that as a confirmation coming from the teacher that you are here or there. The best gauge is just gauge yourself. Can you enter that kind of a stage at every sitting? Even that there's exception, there might be a really bad day Okay. And those bad days, needless to say about that stage, you can't even see level one. Some days just you just collapse. So these kind of things happen. So I'm really trying hard before we talk about these, how to look, how to gauge. Sometimes the teachers they tell you in an indirect way where you are. 
but you must have a very keen and sharp mind, keen and sharp mind to understand it. Sometimes when the message is conveyed, they don't tell you exactly where you are, but they tell you indirectly. Sometimes it's so subtle, it goes over you. So these kind of little things need to be understood for those who are going to practice seriously and father your practice. Okay. So the best thing is simply practice, simply practice. The instructor will tell you what to do, when to do, at that time, at that moment. But the best way is, can I enter that state at almost every sitting? That will give you a straight answer. So after saying that, we can go into these 13 stages of insight. As I said earlier, these are the characteristics of the mind and matter. Or in other words, characteristic of this body and this consciousness. And they are revealed step by step. You can get into this stage step by step. The first one is we are all familiar with it because we talk that quite often. In Pali, okay, it's called Nama, Rupa, Parikshita, Jnana. Nama is mind. Rupa is body. So in discriminate awareness of the mind and body. So what it means in a simple term is, whenever we say self, we just look at one. Okay? But there are two phenomena going on, physical phenomena and mental phenomena, or the body and the mind. And when we practice and when we practice, we begin to see totally, entirely different these phenomena are. Just to make it very simplified, this physical phenomenon looks like orange, and mental phenomenon looks like an apple. That distinctly you understand. They are totally unmixed. But before, it doesn't you don't know, these two are, seems like operating together, but seems like one, act like one, and we always behave as one for these two phenomena. That is the first okay, understanding about mind and matter, physical phenomena and mental phenomena. There are many ways, don't think that everybody will see exactly the same based on the mentality of the person, based on the background meditation experience of the person. It varies from person to person to person. So, yogis like to talk, especially in long retreat. Okay? They're not supposed to talk, but still they talk, okay? whispering. I experienced this, I experienced that, and so on and so forth. And a person who experiences talk that, the rationale is, okay, my friend hasn't experienced it. If I say, if I tell her, if I tell him, okay, he'll be more encouraged to find it. So that is the rationale in that person's mind who is telling it. I'm not saying that is true or not true, but that's how that yogi might explain. I talked to him because he's trying so hard and couldn't find anything. So I'm giving him a little bit of encouragement, a guideline. And then the other yogi, thinking that that's what it is, Nama Rupa is. And then the mind stuck on that explanation example and it tried consciously or subconsciously really trying very hard to experience that, 
and that person will never experience it. Because grasping already gone in. Yes, the friend mentioned to it with the good intention to encourage, to inspire, to give a little bit of a cue or guide. But in actuality, you actually give a blockage to the progress. So keep that in mind. But for some reason, if you happen to hear what you haven't, just hearing, hearing, record it. Don't grasp on it, don't even think about it. Put it at the back of the mind. Know that when you experience it, yours will be entirely different from that person's experience. One person will come in and say, just give a few examples. One, oh, I was meditating and suddenly all that I know is the, the heart. Okay. There's nothing, just simply the heart. Booming, boom, 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 boom. The heart seems to be somewhere. But you have a sense there's the heart beating. And then there's uh, something else that knows that meeting, and they are not close at all. They are totally separated. In other words, let's say there's a space in between. Knowing is just one thing, and their heart beating is one thing. It does not like my heart is beating and I know this mind and body is connected. No, there's no connection, simply heart beating and there's a vibration, you can even feel the vibration, but there's no body. And there's a, a mind that clearly knows, which is totally unaffected by that beating, totally unaffected by that vibration, but still knows that that's a beating and that's the rupa. And that's how one could experience. And that person truly understand physical phenomena and mental phenomena are entirely different and unconnected, unwoven. So another person, if you go say that to somebody else and if somebody is trying to or expecting to have that gone, another person might be just doing walking meditation and then suddenly at one point, just know this whole leg is lifting, pushing, dropping, lifting, pushing, dropping, movement going on. These leg, two legs are as if it is walking on its own. Nothing related with nobody. Nothing related with that self, that person, that yogi. That's more like totally a robot walking. And there's an awareness of that walking. Some people might even say, like, I am outside, I am like, as if looking at it. That is that person experience. But that experience gives a total understanding. Physical phenomenon is one thing and mental phenomenon is another thing. So I can keep on telling many examples, but this at least gives you an idea of it. And also, some of the yogis who goes directly to pure vipassana, okay, pure vipassana, which means they have no other meditation, it goes straight to this rising, falling, and then full foundation. Their experience are a certain way. There are some yogi came in, they have about four, five, six years of anapana or in breath, out breath, very strong, very good. Or they have some other samatha meditation type, very strong, very good. They come in and they follow strictly to full foundation of mindfulness. Their experiences are different. The momentum, energy, and the power of the past carry on, mix with it, and they will experience in a different way. 
So the point I want to make is, if you don't hear anything, simply meditate. But for some reason you heard something from this person or that person in the retreat, outside retreat, you have about a dozen types of different kind of experience stories with you. Don't expect anything of those happen to you. When you experience it, it will be totally unique to your own. But one thing for sure commonality is this physical phenomenon and this mental phenomenon. This action of the body and this knowing of the mind. You can see it in a totally unconnected, separate, different. That is the only commonality. How it presents to one is different. So I think that gives you a, an idea. All that I want the yogi is not to grasp on the insight levels or not to grasp on any of the story you heard. Okay. Don't grasp on anything. Don't hold on to anything. You hear, yes, good information, story in the information department. And when you practice, expect nothing. You simply do. Simply just do it. And these are the, from my point of view, are the important points in this practice. And especially as our series will be oriented based on these insight levels. So that is the discriminative awareness okay, of mind and body. When you have that, that's called level one. And that too, if you say, oh yeah, now I am in level one. Yeah, you have experienced level one. But one thing is once you have it, you keep on practicing, keep on practicing, and even incline your mind, even though you are not in the practice, when you are moving about, incline your mind. Okay. Some yogi, when they are not in the meditation, they go back to your home and they just live as normal as it was. If that's the case, that not. But some yogis, they carry the mindfulness into their daily life and they try their best as mindful as possible. In other words, they actually carry the mindfulness to the best of their ability into their daily lives. And those yogis, okay, if you have experienced once or twice about these nama and rupa, okay, discriminative awareness of nama and rupa, incline your mind to it. Incline your mind to it. I'm not saying recreate it. Incline your mind to it. And in your daily activities, always keep in mind, incline in mind about that level one experience. And slowly and slowly, what will happen is, when even though you are moving about, you begin to feel, you begin to sense the separateness of this mind and body in your daily life. But two things. One thing is carry mindfulness into your daily life. Two is once you have experienced that level, keep your mind inclined to it. And suddenly all your actions, all the objects and all the knowing starting to separate and separate and separate. And it seems like you have a, a sense of almost awareness of this separateness of mind and body. You do not dwell as one anymore. Whenever you are doing something, that sense of separation of body and mind, separation of body, mind, mind, awareness is there. Then you have your level one awareness insight become really strong and is starting to form as a part of you. If you experience once or twice, don't think I'm there. Yes, you have experienced it, but developed it. While you're developing, 
even though that not that much, you might start to become aware of the second one. Okay? Second one is a causal relationship between the mind and body. Okay? Causal relationship between the mind and body is what it is. is Mind and bodies are entirely two different systems, but they communicate. They go back and forth through the law of cause and effect. Through the law of cause and effect. Cause a relationship or conditional relationship. Okay. Right at the beginner's uh, class, we do the exercise, if you remember. Okay, stand. Turn around, intention, okay. so intention and the body movement. That's an exercise, okay, just to make it a little bit more interesting for the beginners yoga, yogis. Oh, they found something, oh, interesting. So they are more encouraged to come, more classes. So that kind of a thing. A way to say is simply okay, when you throw the ball up, it will fall down. Okay? Throwing the ball up is the cause, falling down is the effect. If you don't throw the ball up, it won't fall down. It is as clear as that. Throwing up and falling down are entirely different. Just like that, there's a relationship between the mind and the body. Don't have to go into two details. Most of you are practicing quite a bit. And especially in a walking meditation, you can see the cause and effect. And then especially in a daily activities in retreat, intention, and what follows, cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. These started to come in, okay? But still, I'm going back to the level one. If you are not quite, okay, fluent, constant, have a skill of seeing the Nama and Rupa, don't think you are already graduated from one and you are in a, you are in a second standard. But you will be experiencing both. This one less and the other one more. But this cause and effect is a lot easier to see because intellectually that is very easy to understand. So sometimes you even think you are more skillful in level two and less skillful in level one. As soon as I say skillful, it's experience. So if I'm skillful in number two, I'm over and finished with number one. No. Now, keep your mind carry into daily life. Incline your mind to see Nama and Rupa separately. Incline your mind to see the causal relations of Nama and Rupa separately. Incline your mind but don't force to see it. Whatever will pops up. When the mind is in a balanced state, that thing simply pops up as clear as a, a bird in the sky on a sunny day. Simply incline your mind, incline your mind. Don't force to see it. And that's how one goes up one to the other, one to the other, one to the other. So I use it quite detailed to explain with one and two because most of you have already experienced this one and two. And then the third one, called Samasana Jnana. Samasana Jnana is simply, you see, you have a comprehension or understanding of the three characteristics of mind and matter. What are the three characteristics? Anicca, dukkha, anatta. Impermanence, suffering, and non-self. Okay. 
you began to experience number three. And in here too, first of all, you start experience this thing. Sometimes you see the beginning, sometimes you see the end, but mostly the way you understand the approach is quite different from the other. Because this anicca, dukkha, and natta, the three characteristics of mind and matter, at this number three, you see it. At the highest state, that's all that you see it. But the way you see, the approach you see is different. Okay. From each level to another level to another level. When you experience this, you will understand. It's entirely different approach. That's number one difference. Number two, the clarity that is entirely different. But the whole stages of number three to number 13 is anicca, dukkha, anatta, anicca, dukkha, anatta. That's it. But each level, you understand it with a different approaches, different approach, different approach. So in here, the first one. Okay? The first one is the level three. The first one of the experience of the three characteristics. And this number three, it started with totally different approach. This approach is, it seems like the first level one and two, you are doing very good, great, and you are really high with your progress. And suddenly you collapse. You collapse, collapse means that progression seems to be like almost terminated. And then you go and do a tailspin. Okay. That going into tailspin is actually a jnana. That's why you need a teacher. You go into tailspin, to put in a simplistic way, the approach in here is that tailspin is actually you are experiencing a dukkha, suffering. But you don't know, especially if there is nobody to tell you, you really get disappointed. So the approach here says you started from the dukkha. From the dukkha, you carry on, and then it comes into anicca, and then anatta. In this level three, always start with the approach come from dukkha first. And in here too, as we go along, I will go into detail, because if I go into details, uh, we won't finish at all. This number three, experiencing level three, anicca, dukkha, and anatta. Because of that, the teachers need to guide. Because of that, once the teacher told you this or that, you have to have a certain degree of reflectiveness. Okay. Sometimes you just go into tailspin, nothing is good, really bad, disappointing. At that moment you have to say, no, this is dukkha, no, this is dukkha. In fact, you have to talk a little bit to yourself, this is dukkha. That kind of guidance is needed a little bit. But don't think that is all that you understood about Nietzsche, Dukkha, and Nata. In this level three, okay, there are so many different ways of experiencing this Nietzsche, Dukkha, and Nata. Sometimes it even seems like, seems like you are in the higher level. Again, it varies from yogi to yogi. You, and some yogi is still that struggling with uh, this is dukkha, this is dukkha, and it goes through. But some yogi, based on their parami, they experience in such a different way, quite uniquely experience, unique experience, they think they are already in the very higher level. 
in this number three, a lot of yogis can got, can lost their track. You need a guide. The one who are really down, you need inspiration of the teacher. The one, even still at level three, sometimes their experience are so good, they really need the teacher to put their ego down. The second one is tougher, but not many, a few are. They thought already high and flying. So again to in here, that feeling of anicca, dukkha, anatta starting to okay, indicate into your daily life. Suddenly something happened, at the same moment you can feel the anicca or dukkha. Something happened, at that moment you can sense the feel very, very sharply. Okay? I don't say clearly, more like sharply, like sink into the needle, a sense of emptiness. There are many ways of experiencing this anatta. I can talk and talk and talk. So keep that in mind. This level three is, as I say, based on the yogi, some people really need to pull up and they could hardly get up, and some people really fly. Number three. Number four is, inside knowledge of arising and passing away. And in here, one see when the object arises. Okay, rising and falling is too long. Okay, rising, 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 falling, 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 falling. So beginning at the end or rising to the end. Not that in your rising movement. Okay, let's say you see about when you say rising, they are about three or four successive stages of rising you will experience. But you can see each stage, the beginning and the end, the beginning and the end, the beginning and the end. When you are at that level, that's how you see. Again too, there are three different levels. You just step into that level four, you practice farther, you become quite skillful, and eventually you mature. That kind of seeing is called insight knowledge of arising and passing away. And after that is insight knowledge of dissolution. You're watching these things and all that you see is you don't see the beginning, you don't see the middle, you don't see any part, you only see the end. That's the another insight. So that's number five. And after that, suddenly everything is just so rapidly passing away under your nose. You become scared, actually scared, afraid. Because it seems like this, what we dearly hold on the self, the self itself, it seems like being sucked out or sucked away. That kind of sensation could arise. That is the fearfulness. Okay. And then once we got after that, then suddenly what happened was you become to feel miserable inside knowledge of misery. Okay. The same thing, everything is about anicca, dukkha and anatta in a very different way, sometime with ex nature, sometime with dukkha, sometime with anatta. But now when you come to this level, each yogi is being, have their own little tracks. Some yogis see more of anicca, less of the other two. Some yogis see more of dukkha, less of the other two. Some yogis see more of anatta, less of the other two. Based on that mentality, 
I can go farther and why, who, what is inclined to, but this is not the time yet. So you become miserable and then finally you totally got disgusted with it. That is another level. So even though we are saying separately, fearful, miserable, disgust, it is not that you are going one stage to the other. In here they are all mixed in. Mixed in. But where you really are, it depending on what kind of feeling is dominant. But you will get at all those three feelings at almost all the time. But one feeling dominates, whether the fear or the misery or the disgust. That's how you can tell. But in general, don't even bother to define where you are in those things. They come in like a storm. And then, after the disgust, you begin to pick up again. It seems like everything just falls apart. And then you start practicing again. Because you want to get away from all these things. Okay, that insight, wanting to be liberated, or insight of deliverance. See? I won't repeat the Pali words. The Pali words are already there. Mongchitu kabinatyana. And when you want to deliver, be liberated, then you have to start around that time in other words, you have to pick up all the pieces again. All the pieces again, as if you are starting from great one. And that is a pati senka na nyana. And then after that, when you practice together, slowly the next level is to go into the state of equanimity. At that moment, what happened was, everything is like a flow. You can see everything without putting effort, without doing sitting meditation. And of course, if it's sitting meditation, even better. But when you are there, when you're walking, when you're eating, things like that, that sense of the flow of everything. In other words, to put it in a different way, you can see everything as a process. Everything is a process. Everything is working like tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, cause and effect, nama rupa. Everything is like a flow. You see there. And after that, okay, how many jnanas now we are? Equanimity. Uh, and after that, what happened is, they call it the insight knowledge of adaptation or adaptability. And in there, in other words, you have perfected the understanding of anicca, dukkha, and anatta at that level. In other words, you really adapt into it. And especially to the concept of anatta, non-self. Okay. Before as I mentioned to you, some are stronger in Anicca, some are stronger in Dukkha, some are stronger in Anatta. But in here, at the stage of adaptation, especially the sense of uncontrollability or non-self or emptiness, that become more distinct and clear. And after that is, the next one is called Trouble, 13th stage. That is the stage, is the threshold between this Bhutujana lineage and the Arya lineage. You are right at the threshold. And when you pass over the threshold, then that is the first time you experience Nibbana. So those are the 13 stages of insight. 
and this will be invariably used as a guide, as an example to explain our practice throughout this Dharma talk of the series A. So may all of you be able to practice Satipatthana Vipassana meditation precisely, correctly, patiently, with full commitment. And may you be able to achieve all these insights as soon as possible. Sadhu, 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 buddham bhujemi. Dhammam Jemi Sangam Jemi